I wanted to talk about becoming an authority in trauma-informed care. And part of the reason for this is that trauma-informed has, has kind of become a bit of a buzz phrase over the last few years. A lot of people are talking about trauma. A number of years ago, uh, had the opportunity to participate in uh, New Wine, New Wine Skins uh, trauma and resilience themed conference. And even at that time, though it's been a couple of years, the, the concept of being trauma-informed in terms of, of ministry have been out there a while. And um, those of you that, that may be listening in that are connected to uh, other, other industries or the, or the medical field know that that phrase has been around much longer in, in other aspects of work uh, besides ministry. And so ministry still is kind of catching up in a way. And also we're, since the phrase is, has come into common uh, parlance, we're, we're sometimes at the point where uh, we're talking past one another because we don't, we're not, we're using the same terms, but not necessarily meaning the same thing. So I'm going to take a look at becoming an authority in trauma-informed care and through the lens of balancing legitimacy and power in, in ministry to others. And just so you know where this discussion is going, I'm going to hit three major points. The first is that legitimacy is, is formed through relational integrity. And uh, that's where we, we all want to start in ministry, is rather than doing something to people or being something for someone, we want to be in relationship with people. Uh, secondly, uh, that power is demonstrated in ability and applied knowledge to achieve results where others fail. And in the area of mental health and addressing the effects of trauma, most often that failure is, is just um, known through the, the failure to engage, to, to be a part of the conversation or to see it as part of our ministry model to our communities. And then thirdly, that legitimacy and power wedded together is what provides authority. So if we're thinking about being, being an authority and, and where did I get these terms or where did I get this as a framework? Um, a, a while back, I was spending some time preparing this particular passage that, that came up in the liturgy and it just so wonderfully spoke to the balance in Jesus's ministry between legitimacy and power and how that distinguished his ministry from those of the teachers of the law. So we're going to start with Mark 1, 21 through 28. It says, they went to Capernaum, and when Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. And the people were also amazed and they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. So starting with that as a, as a framework, I wanna take a look first at legitimacy and then at power, and then how um, those are uh, exemplified in Jesus's ministry and how we can use that as a, a framework for seeing our own ministries and how we will address the issues of trauma and mental health in people's lives. So you see there kind of a, a just a real basic Venn diagram that where power and legitimacy overlap, uh, those that hold both tend to be viewed as authorities on subjects in our culture. And legitimacy is earned through the expression of compassion and competence and basic ministry skills. These, these are uh, I think of these as the things that sort of drew us all into ministry, that we wanted to uh, help people, 
that we were interested in investing in people relationally. And legitimacy is built upon a track record of dependability and faithfulness and just simply being there for people. That was one of the things that was talked about in the, in the panel is that, that ministry of presence, for instance. And legitimacy instills trust. So how did Jesus display his legitimacy? Well, first of all, he addressed core human needs. Uh, in, the, in the passage that directly precedes the one that I'm um, using as a framework, Mark, uh, in, his, in typical fashion, really succinctly puts Jesus's first message that, that he was sharing. He says, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. And so in that, I see sort of Jesus's three R's. Um, first, realize that there's a new reality, right? The, the time has come, the kingdom has come near. And then knowing that there's a new reality at hand, recognize the, the proper action to, to take, right? If there is, if, if something new is being ushered in, uh, how... How does that change the way I perceive the world? And then the third R, respond accordingly. Once your perception has changed, once you realize that maybe the way you've been seeing the world is, um, is not the most accurate depiction of what's going on, then how do you respond accordingly? Now that's Jesus's three R's and in my estimation, uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration uh, or you know, that abbreviation, uh, S-A-M-S or H-S-A, they, they have a four, the four R's for trauma-informed care. So perhaps you've seen these uh, before or, or heard uh, referred to the four R's of trauma-informed care, but uh, a quick breakdown of what that is, is the first R being realization. If there's a realization of trauma and how it can affect people and groups. And then there's a recognition of the signs of trauma, you know, kind of how it presents itself. And uh, many of the, the, as you'll see here in just a minute or two, uh, many of the signs of trauma are displayed through mental health issues. And, and I'll, I'll be speaking specifically to my experience in working with traumatized youth. It's by, I, I don't by any means mean to speak to the entire breadth of trauma effect. Um, and then the third R being having a system which can respond to trauma. So once you realize its effect on individuals and you can recognize uh, when somebody might be coming from a trauma effect or have be trauma affected, how do you respond to that? And then forming the last R kind of forming systems and forming culture around a priority of resisting re-traumatization. Uh, so how do we organize our spaces so that they're, uh, they're safe and that they're trauma-informed so that um, not that we can totally avoid people being re-traumatized or, or triggered by, um, by events that may happen in community, but that we are being purposeful in the way we, we form community together so that we're as helpful a space as we can be in resisting re-traumatization. So that's that's the the first the first key is the teach Jesus's teaching addressed uh, core human needs. So that's the first first way that he displayed his legitimacy. And then secondly, his in invitation, if you think about it, was relational. Right when he was calling his disciples, it wasn't about uh, come come join this way of thinking or this philosophy. It was come follow me, all right? Connect to me relationally. And then in turn, I will send you out to fish for people in Mark 1, 17. So his invitation was relational. It was to join a, a group of people that had the desire of affecting others. Now, Jesus's actions also uh, enabled restoration. This was something that was spoken to in the panel last night. I really appreciate that the, um, the community nature of mental health and mental wellness was kind of brought to the fore. Because I see that Jesus' actions always uh, 
somewhere behind those actions was this desire to enable restoration in individuals and for the purpose of connecting them once again to community. So we see that um, in the verse where it says, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit. Now, I've got that little illustration there. Hopefully you can see that fairly well. So some disabilities look like this, and you've got, uh, looks like an amputee, somebody with crutches, uh, an individual in a wheelchair, one with the walker, one with the cane, and then some look like this, and it just looks like a regular figure. And for those um, that are working through a mental health diagnosis, or, or maybe it's undiagnosed, but you, you have a sense that uh, that something isn't right, or you're caring for an individual with, uh, with mental health uh, issues that uh, are still being attended to, and you're seeking better wellness. Some of the struggle in connecting to a faith community is that your, your disability or your illness um, or, or that issue that you're struggling with is, is not seen, it's not obvious. And so there can tend to be a compassion gap between uh, those whose illnesses or injuries are um, obvious in their physical bodies and those that aren't. And I speak from personal experience in this. Uh, my older brother had muscular dystrophy. So when I was growing up and he was in a wheelchair, people treated him differently, you know, uh, and that was both a good thing and a bad thing, as you might imagine. But there was no ignoring the fact that, um, that he was in a wheelchair and that accommodations would need to be made. Now, conversely, now as a parent of a child that has mental health issues, he often presents, especially in public settings, uh, very charming and engaging. And if there's nothing, uh, nothing wrong until there is, and then it's usually quite explosive and difficult to to handle. So um, Jesus's actions towards this man, but I suspect, you know, that, that if he had always kind of acted out, uh, so to speak, um, in, in causing a ruckus in the synagogue, um, if that was a regular occurrence, he probably would not have been asked to be back. So at some, uh, at some sense, the fact that he was there and was part of that community uh, signals to me that that this interaction he had with Jesus is an unusual occurrence uh, because Jesus was bringing uh, with him, obviously, God's presence in a unique way. And so Jesus's ability to speak to his need was unique from what he had received in that community up to this point. Because what is, um, I've got there besides the illustration, what's not realized goes untreated. What's not recognized is mis often misunderstood. And what's not responded to increases shame and isolation. So if you're, if you're a part of a community that doesn't speak to the issues that you're dealing with, uh, pretty soon you're going to think, I'm the only one dealing with this. I'm the only one struggling with this. And, um, and then rather than doing anything that would even hint at self-disclosure or vulnerability, there's the tendency uh, and I've seen this in the children and the families that that I've served uh, a a drawing back. And we're lucky if they do keep attending. In a lot of cases, there's some sort of outburst that is misunderstood um, and and causes a relational rift between that family and the worshiping community, and they just pull back entirely. And Jesus' acts on behalf of that individual. In, in this passage within the context of the corporate and the communal. So the restoration isn't just about healing the individual, it's healing the individual so they can be once again a part of community together. Real quickly on the link between trauma and mental illness, because um, this is a conference on mental illness, um, not specifically on trauma, but the, the children that I work with, their mental health issues all arise from adverse childhood experiences, sometimes referred to as ACEs. Um, and that graphic there that hopefully you can see most of 
and isn't isn't blocked by the video. Uh, it comes from the World Health Organization. It's something that is is uh, fairly common if you if you look at ACEs and their effect. This relationship between early childhood trauma and health and well-being uh, um, outcomes later in life. So at the base of that pyramid is kind of birth, and then as you get towards the top of the pyramid, um, the end of uh, mortal life. All right, and those with a higher uh, with higher ACE scores in the sense they've had a number of traumas that have happened to them in early childhood tend to have social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. Um, they have adopt at-risk behaviors. They're at greater probability for disease, disability, and social problems. And then ultimately um, those with, with early childhood trauma um, die at an earlier age. And the most common mental health outcomes from ACEs that I see in my work are PTSD, and I also have PTSI, um, because uh, PTSD is the, is the term that's most commonly known as post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I, I believe in kind of the shift that I'm seeing in, in labeling it more post-traumatic stress injury, because it is an injury that happens to an individual through a traumatic circumstance or occurrence. And um, I've also had suggested to me that we should change the P as well, that there's nothing post about post-traumatic stress injury, that it should be changed to present because that uh, much more accurately encaptures, uh, encapsulates what an individual is dealing with, that, that yes, there's something that has occurred in the past, but it's triggered and, and there's a re-traumatization process over and over again um, that when that individual is, is triggered and that trauma is once again revisited as if it's happening to them right then in that moment. Um, so PTSD, PTSI, um, depression, and then anxiety disorders, any host of anxiety disorders, most commonly with the children because there isn't a whole lot of track record in in uh, working with them, it just kind of gets labeled uh, generalized anxiety disorder. So that link between trauma and mental illness is, is kind of why I'm, I'm focusing on um, my expertise in working with uh, trauma-affected children and my desire to help build trauma-informed ministries and how it connects with mental illness. So how does a ministry begin with legitimacy? Well, um, there's a lot of text here. Uh, I'm just going to share with you the, the, the key takeaways. Ed uh, Stetzer, in a, a piece that he did for Christianity Today a number of years ago, uh, just talked about the fact that uh, a survey that was done of individuals with mental health diagnoses that were still a part of congregations and were looking to connect with congregations simply wanted to be treated as people and not as outcasts. They didn't want to be uh, marginalized. They just wanted people to, uh, and fellow church members to get to know them as a friend. And, you know, that's 70% of Protestants that with mental illness uh, said that they, that they just wanted somebody to try to connect with them relationally. And for those that were consistent church attenders, that number climbed almost 80%. They want to be treated like a person, which sometimes even those in ministry can for forget to do because they come to us very obviously presenting um, an issue with their, their mental illness. So there's something that's off relationally. And then our, our, um, the way we've often been trained to do ministry is that, well, here's somebody with a problem. They want me to fix it. So, so we, they, get to, they get to used to being treated as a, as a project rather than a person. And so here's the ways that those individuals say that the church could assist them. Um, you know, nearly uh, three-fourths of the family help families find local resources for support in dealing with mental illness. The 63% they talk about it openly, so the topic's not taboo. Uh, preach about it, teach about it, have small group Bible studies about it, and not just for those individuals that um, have self-identified as people that um, 
have mental health as part of their faith experience. Do it as something that would be good for the entire church to know, because it is good for the entire church to know. Um, if if you're not if you haven't personally uh, had experience with mental illness, chances are you are closely connected to someone who has. And so it it doesn't make any sense for this to be a, a niche ministry or something that's off to the side. 61% wanted to uh, see people's understanding improved in terms of what mental illness is and what to expect. Um, that it's not uncommon for there to be this kind of cycle uh, for many, you know, including my son of periods of time when, where he's better and then rehospitalization or going back into treatment. And that that is not a moral failure, that that is, that is something that is common to, um, to the process that was spoken of last night on the panel, that this is a, a process of engaging mental health. Uh, provide training for the church to understand uh, mental illness was, was mentioned by over half the individuals, as well as just increasing awareness of how prevalent mental illness is today. So that kind of gets at the legitimacy piece. The second piece is, is power. And I would say, don't be afraid of your power. More often than not, those that that have um, that understand that mental health is something they need to attend to are going to engage a faith community, and they're going to do that before they talk to um, a a doctor about it or a mental health professional. Uh, more often than not, if they're already connected to a faith community, they're going to seek some spiritual guidance and power. Um, I want to reframe kind of a sense of power. Power is not often, especially in this passage where, you know, there's this interaction with the, the demon affected man where there's, you know, he leaves with a shriek. There's, you know, there's a big show. Um, Jesus's display of power is just in a word. All right. So power is displayed in being able to accomplish a task or the ability to succeed, especially if it's in an area where others have failed. All right, and that there's power, I would say, in persistence and competence, and that competence instills confidence in individuals. And the church has power. The community of faith has power. Not, uh, not only and just because we have Jesus indwelling us, but because we, we articulate the love and grace of God to one another. And we can be a compelling environment for acceptance for those individuals who don't find it uh, elsewhere. So how did Jesus display his power? Real quickly, he connected with his hearers. So the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. And Jesus' power was how he connected with people. It wasn't about knowing what was right and what was wrong and telling people what to do, they had that example for them in the teachers of the law. So Jesus was distinguishing himself on a relational level in connecting with his hearers. He was able to accomplish that which others were not. The people were amazed and they asked each other, what is this? It's a new teaching and with authority. He, he even gives orders to spirit. So now, now what that suggests to me is that they weren't, they weren't just defining uh, that power with, with the action of the impure spirits. It, it had to do with the totality of who he was, how, how he taught, how he carried himself. And then it was almost an outgrowth of that, that you know, he could speak to the impure spirits and they obey him. Um, so he has authority and he even gives orders to the impure spirits. And Jesus's power um, came from his, his ability to live within the will of the Father, right? So um, that, that idea of, and not necessarily in this passage, but, you know, in the, in the healing of the paralytic man who's, whose friends bring him to him on the mat, you know, um, he's all there and Jesus has got this kind of pregnant moment where everybody is looking and what's he going to say? What's he going to do? And he forgives the man's sins. He's interested in bringing him back into right relationship. 
And everybody is shocked at that. He says, well, listen, is it, is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to take up your mat and walk? And so uh, Jesus's desire to connect with people on a, on a relational level uh, can even be sin, seen in his uh, salvific work, you know, in the, in the desire to bring uh, healing from sin sickness. And then uh, he recognized what others ignored or had learned to tolerate and marginalize. And back to that point that there, this was a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit. So um, there was something unique about the way Jesus taught that then caused this individual to recognize who Jesus was and the spirit within him say, listen, we know who you are and what you've come to do. And you're about to change everything. So Jesus recognized what others ignored and had learned to tolerate and marginalize. How does a ministry display power? Well, through that connection with trauma-affected people and those with mental health issues, in order to accomplish what others have not, so display some level of competency within the context of community. And I think we do this by, by learning um, that bruised reeds and smoldering wicks curriculum that I came up with. Uh, was a desire to frame this topic within something that was easily accessible to, uh, to church audiences. We're used to doing small groups and Bible studies for a period of time. So my thought was, why don't we take a look at the science of ACEs, trauma effect, and mental illness, and, and put it in a context that um, is going to be easily received by those in, in a church context. So that's... Um, so learning through, you know, something like that, or there's other great resources. I know you're going to get at the close of the conference uh, a list. Um, there's a great one that comes out of the Partnership Center from uh, the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C. Um, because there's been a change of administrations uh, back and forth, the, the individuals that have headed up that Partnership Center have, have changed over time. But what hasn't changed is that they're doing excellent work in engaging uh, mental health issues in faith communities. Um, and I can, th I've, I've shared that link to, uh, to a resource specific to ministries that are looking to form um, and start mental health supports within their communities. Um, we also display this through a, a posture of humility and persistence. We're not going to get it right. Um, we're going to misstep. And even when we are right, those that um, those that are are coming to our faith communities with uh, with issues of of mental illness are not always going to let on that that we were right or that we were we were addressing their need. Um, and so just being persistent relationally. And then collaboration, I spoke to this a little bit on the panel last night. I those families, those individuals, those couples, uh, those children, that are working through mental health diagnoses, they, they are forced to become collaborators because they have a whole team of individuals around them that, um, that are giving them input on how to manage their mental health. And so as ministries, we don't want to think we have the answer in addressing what their need is. Um, we're going to be a part of a larger team. So the, the, to the greater degree that we can collaborate um, I mentioned the Health and Human Services and the um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, NAMI is an excellent organization as well. Um, healthcare professionals. You know, there's a whole host of, of people that can be drawn. You know, sometimes it's just starting with the seminar on a, on a Sunday afternoon, or in this case, you know, you could do it via Zoom on um, you know, mental health and, and substance abuse and how those two are interrelated on um, um, suicide awareness and training. There's lots of, once you kind of open the door and you let those that are in these fields, a lot of times um, they have grants or they have uh, objectives to try to reach out into faith communities. So if you're one of those pastors that raises their, you know, your hand and says, we'd be willing to host or we would love to have you do a training as part of our faith community, um, and they know that, then 
they're like wonderful and and you're you're connected and it's um you're providing a service to not only your existing faith community but to the community at large so becoming an authority taking that the legitimacy, the, the piece, the aspects of what we are really good at as church relationally when we're when we're doing church well. And the power, the ability to learn and grow and build competency in these areas. When we merge those two together, that's when we become an authority in trauma-informed care in our ministry settings. And it again, it doesn't mean we have to be perfect. It doesn't mean that our pastors have to become therapists or counselors so that we as small group leaders have to do this, um, but that we lean into those strengths and those competencies um, that are kind of at ground level, the things we can, uh, we can learn and address first and then uh, address those issues. And it's going to be a journey of learning and growing. But as, as noted in some of those statistics that were shared earlier in terms of what those with mental health issues are looking to uh, looking to the church for, they're they're pretty simple, and they're not looking for us to be experts. They're looking for us, again, to be an authority, somebody that could speak into their lives. So, went through a lot really quickly. I haven't checked the time. I think, um, how much time do we have, Trudy, in order to address questions that kind of circle back to things? You have until 1020, so it's um, about 1007 right now, so. Great, so I left us about 13 minutes to, uh, to take questions. I know um, in these areas, not just because I'm the presenting presenter, there are certainly issue, uh, issues that have been raised that there might be um, some expertise even in this group as well. So if you've got a question, raise your hand and and uh, Trudy will make sure that that uh, you get a chance to, to ask those questions. So, um, Chris, could you maybe stop the screen share and then that way yeah. be more of who's here? Absolutely. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Any comments or questions for Chris that people would like to share? Oh, Eric. Yeah, thanks, Trudy. Yep. Uh, nice job, Chris. Um, I thought it uh, when you mentioned that uh, the impact from trauma and ACEs and whatnot on children who, you know, deal with those and become adults, of course, that it, it's not a moral failure. I thought that was very poignant. And I would, I would add to that, um, as you self-disclosed, you know, dealing with one of your own children, um, it's not the result of bad parenting either. And uh, right. yeah. I, I think it's those myths that are out there that it's important to dispel those because that will that will help equip the church, um, you know, to, uh, I think, um, move into a stronger power position with that relationship. So good. good yeah, job. Ex excellent point, Eric. And I, and I even knowing what I know there are plenty of times that I would enter into the worship, worshiping communities that we've been a part of at the times when, um, when our son has, has been at home with us in our care, uh, where you could kind of sense that they're getting dysregulated and your anxiety level goes up and you're like, oh, where is this going to lead? Now, thankfully, we've been a part of churches that are, are pretty well trauma-informed um, and purposefully have engaged in um, training the congregation and making the congregation aware of any host of um, uh, of issues around the larger topic of mental health. And so um, for, for a small congregation in relatively rural Montana, um, the, the resources that we have and the understanding that we have in that faith community are really excellent. But um, those families, you know, I'd say nine out of 10 uh, while I was uh, actively the chaplain at Intermountain Residential, um, would come to me and they'd say, you know, we were part of a faith community until, and then they would describe an experience where their child acted out, um, you know, grabbed a pair of scissors, threatened another kid, uh, screamed in the middle of service, and then 
every head kind of turned and looked at them, you know, and that's not unique to the children and families. That's, um, you know, in, in churches where we served the homeless population in the past and that they're welcome to, to, to join uh, Sunday services. There would be times when, you know, there would be an outburst or there would be something going on. And, and if you can just raise the level of awareness within the church congregation uh, to be a little accepting of that and to have a plan around, um, you know, creating a safe space for those individuals uh, when those circumstances occur and they get a little dysregulated, it can go a long ways towards bringing healing. Thanks. Chris. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to also say to all, if you're welcome to um, put yourself back on um, visual, it, we, we want to encourage the discussion and, um, and sometimes having faces, you know, don't, you know, I appreciate all of the mute um, that just cuts down on the interruptions. I appreciate that. Um, just if there's somebody else that has a question, but um, I'm going to just kind of keep it rolling a little bit um, from a child and a family member that has some interesting behaviors at times. Um, how do you navigate with people, especially the families when they're dealing with, I just feel so judged, you know, right. because they say, you know, well, if you were a better parent, this wouldn't happen, especially yeah. that idea of, well, he doesn't look like there's something going on, but yet there is. How do you deal with that whole idea of judgment? Yeah, that's hard. I mean, we're, um, and then I see, Marie, you've got your hand up, but we'll come to you here in just a second. Um, you know, the, the reason that, that churches are criticized for being judgmental is that often we're judgmental for any number of reasons. And, and some of that's just human nature. Um, and I try to uh, counsel those families and those children to say, um, listen, these people mean well and they wanna to get to know you. And they just don't know this aspect of you yet or what your family is about, and what you're struggling with. And, and if they were to know, you can be sure that you would receive a greater level of compassion and understanding. And, um, you know, sometimes families just aren't comfortable going back to a place where they they felt injured um, and, and judged so much. So sometimes it's a, it could be just redirecting them to another worshiping community. Sometimes it's, you know, uh, trying to facilitate a discussion with the pastor so that they're aware um, because often people will tell things to the pastor that they don't tell the larger faith community, um, including, you know, here's an issue we have going on in our home. Um, if you, you know, I, I know as a pastor, there been times when people have shared things with me about their personal struggles. And I'll say, you know what, um, I've had other individuals in this community that have shared similar struggles. Um, and if they would be willing to meet with you and you with them, I think it could be a really helpful connection. Um, and that's, uh, you know, when you're, it, it gets a little complicated because you're having to ask permission on both sides. You don't want to betray confidences. So you don't say, hey, and, you know, and go right out and name an individual uh, because that would not be appropriate. Uh, but often, these family, I know our family was desperate for connection with other parents that were going through the same thing. And so um, when, when we kind of came forward and said, hey, this is what we're dealing with, it's obvious, you're seeing it on Sunday mornings, um, that, that led other people to, to be open to kind of self-disclose and, and connect with us. Um, and then they, they're initiating that rather than the pastor being a go-between and then then you then you don't have to worry about those issues of confidentiality and the like awesome we have about five minutes you said that somebody had yeah marie to... and then i'm sure becca has uh, something to add to this as well i see her hand up but um marie was had her hand up first I want to make sure we address that kind of a quick comment is that kind of all my neurons are firing right now because i <laughs> love where you put this the intersection of and the theolo theology and what's in our head and you're making it real. And I'm working right now as a chaplain in a children's hospital focusing mm. on mental health. 
So yeah. I'm working with a lot of these patients and I'm also finding what you're talking about to be tremendously validating for me just because of my experiences and things that I'm kind of learning on my own. I just feel, I'm feeling very connected with <clears throat> your, what you're talking about. And I like your approach with authority and connection and how we can walk into those spaces as maybe a chaplain or a pastor and then how the church can be connected in a real way. Like it's one thing to think about these things, but it's another thing, like what do you do when a kid's acting out? Right. And how do we love people in that space? So it's just kind of a comment to say, I'm really loving this discussion. Thank you, Marie. I appreciate that. And Becca, I, I know from a therapist standpoint, um, this is something you probably can speak into as well. So Becca, I wanna give you a chance. Oh, sure. I I wasn't really going to speak into anything okay. other right. than to make a comment of gratitude to say I really appreciated, um, uh, first of all, what Eric had said about uh, the comments about morality, but then also the thing that I has been kind of percolating for me is this idea of the church having power. Mm -hmm. um, and right. I, I really ha hear that as this invitation to be proactive right. versus passive. And um, I'm just grateful for that. So thank you for your talk in that way. Yeah, I think that's so, I, thank you, Becca. I appreciate that because um, I think when somebody is hurting, whether it's mentally, physically, emotionally, relationally, and they're coming to the church, they're looking for help. They're looking for, for us to be in an authority. So if we, if we misunderstand humility to mean, you know, I don't have the answers. I couldn't possibly help. I'm going to have to refer you to somebody else. You're scary. Then, <laughs> then we're, I think we're selling ourselves short in terms of the power we do possess um, relationally and connectionally and, and as communities of faith. Um, but we're also, um, we're not also not entering into ministry and giving God an opportunity to use us in a powerful way for these people that are looking to us for help. We have about two more minutes. Is there some other comments or questions? Uh, yes. Um, Tasha? Tasha. Tasha, <laughs> great. Um, okay, so um, I just wanted to, well, I want to thank you again um, with everyone else. But, um, I really appreciate what you've been sharing um, and we'll continue to do, to look into your devotionals and research and um, I just really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> So, I mean, there's not enough time for me to say all that I want to say. Um, sure. but I, um, my experience with, you know, having two children with um, unique and severe needs, um, um, they're my only kids, um, and being, having like a history of trying a couple different churches and then pulling, you know, pulling back and then trying another one, pulling back, and then doing an intimate home church with a, with a smaller group of people and um, experiencing struggles there with, you know, half the church had, you know, mental health struggles, um, right. separate ones, right? And so I just, um, and then pulling back and like, there's so much pain um, with that disconnection and not, uh, and I definitely find that I've been in this survival mode for so long that right. being in a, in a bigger community setting requires a lot of work and effort to be vulnerable to like so many people versus a smaller group. And what I right. found um, with, you know, I ended up moving, we ended up moving out into the country next to one of the church members, one of my best friends. And I see what I'm finding has been most helpful for me is like an individual, individual church members functioning as the body of Christ or, you know, the body in the church um, being really helpful to like our family that's so overwhelmed and so sensitive, like everything's loud. And so that decreasing that community or the size has been helpful, but there's also been this, like, I feel like that's been a failure though, because I feel like I want to, I want to be open. I want to enter community, but it's just too hard right now, you know? And so I just want to, I want to say that, that like, it's so important to know that like even just one person can like make a huge um, impact and change um, functioning as a church. 
Absolutely. And, and that one individual expressing the love and care of Jesus Christ as an expression of the larger church family. Um, so often, and, and I don't fault our pastors for it because their, their pastors, these men and women have so much pressure put on them to look successful by having as many people possible in large group settings, you know, so that, that if they see a family, you know, and their engagement with you and your children is, is fairly minimal and you've come and then all of a sudden you drop off, um, that, that signals failure in most, in most church circles, um, either on the family's part or on the pastor's part or, or what didn't work out. And so kind of redefining what means success in, in, in community is important too, that we want to connect people relationally.